Thank you everyone for coming today to our first um, ever Berlin The Graph meetup hosted by Deutsche Telekom, Poab and some pizzas. Um, today we have some very interesting keynotes from uh, four speakers. One of them being Mujtaba Idres. Woo. Um, followed by Colson from Mujtaba from Deutsche Telekom, of course. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Colson from uh, the Graph Advocates DAO. Woo. Then we have uh, Martin from uh, Pinux following up over there. And finally, uh, Paul from Kaif will will give some uh, insights into how they operate with data. So I'm going to give it up for Mujtaba real quick. And thank you very much. Thank you, Toby, um, for the nice introduction. I hope you guys can hear me good. So um, I welcome you all uh, to this uh, community event organized by Deutsche Telekom uh, and the Graph Foundation. Um, my name is Mujtaba Idris. Uh, I'm IT architect and also working for the Web3 strategy in Deutsche Telekom. Whenever we go out in the community and uh, talk to uh, the blockchain guys, we are also the blockchain guys, when we, but when we talk to outside, we always get asked this question that what the hell Deutsche Telekom is doing in Web3? And, and rightly so, because uh, traditionally we are seen as a, a trusted third party, which is pretty centralized. And uh, yeah, but we have... Uh, like a long history, which kind of defines uh, at least our thought process, uh, why we are in this space. So in order to answer this question, maybe we can go back uh, in, into the history and see what we have been doing for the past 100 years. Um, basically, uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, if I summarize what we've been doing it all along this time, I can summarize it in, in, it in one sentence. We, are, we have been providing infrastructure. Deutsche Telekom is providing has been providing infrastructure for telephone lines to connect different people. So we've been laying out these cables. Um, then Deutsche Telekom provided a lot of uh, mobile data infrastructure, uh, for example, GSM, uh, LTE services, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, even fiber optics, um, yeah, fiber cable and stuff. So basically, uh, and also we have our own public cloud, so we provide um, Web2 infrastructure as well. So we think uh, it makes sense that we also part, uh, play our part uh, in providing Web3 infrastructure because Web3 is supposed to be uh, the future of internet. So uh, yeah, but that's our reasoning, how we think uh, we are into, uh, how we place ourselves into, into this whole ecosystem and why we think um, it makes sense for us to be in this space. But the question is is very relevant, centralization or decentralization? Because as I said, uh, we are normally seen as a pretty centralized, uh, trusted third party. So um, yeah, in order to explain uh, better, let me tell you a story. So when we started this blockchain department in 2017 and we went out to different corporate customers that we had, uh, we pitched them this nice idea of blockchain solutions and how it can improve their processes, um, automated payments could be made, uh, different actions could be, done, uh, could be, could be taken after these payments. Um, we had some questions from these customers which I can categorize them as more like onboarding questions. Uh, and the biggest question that was uh, always asked is, is there an API for the blockchain? <laughs> can you somehow provide us a managed services so that we don't have to take care of all the infrastructure and all the underlying troubles beneath and uh, we can just rely you as a trusted third party. Uh, yeah, and so began our humble beginnings where we actually um, started uh, pretty centralized. Uh, we started with um, providing managed blockchain infrastructure for permission blockchains, uh, yeah, which was, uh, yeah, which, which made sense at that time because a lot of other corporates were also doing that uh, in 2018 or so. But pretty soon we realized that this is not the way to go if we have to survive survive in this industry in the long run. And uh, we also um, re-strategized ourselves to the ethos of the blockchain and um, the, the, true, uh, the true sense of decentralization behind. And uh, now we think that we want to place ourselves as a, uh, as a, in order to enable this uh, digital revolution, 
uh, we need to provide full support to the communities and the protocols. Uh, and we need to put everything that is at, at our disposal, uh, be it the solutions that we can build or the infrastructure support that we can provide. Uh, we do not see ourselves anymore as a centralized provider in the space. We, we see ourselves as a digital enabler. And that's why uh, we are providing infrastructure and solution services to different blockchain protocols. For example, we started with providing Oracle for Chainlink services, and then we started validation services for different blockchains. Um, and right now, we are also um, providing ecosystem support. And especially uh, in this third iteration, we are focusing on um, the blockchains that actually are trying to solve some certain blockchain use cases, where we also see the graph at the middle of it. And uh, Graph is also interesting for us because Graph enables us to index the blockchain data and also Web2 data. So in a way, it can provide a decentralized uh, service uh, that can provide data to different applications, so dApps and also normal uh, applications. Uh, we have millions of uh, worth of euros under stake. Uh, we are currently supporting more than 10 different block blockchain protocols. Uh, from the infrastructure side, we have our own NFT marketplace solution. Uh, we have uh, we are also heavily invested in self-sovereign identity stack. Uh, we are currently working uh, with German government and also European government uh, regarding the SSI specifications. So in future, there will be uh, verifiable credentials issued to the citizens uh, uh, yeah, for their identity cards and passwords and stuff. So we are also involved there. So this is like a summary of what we do on the blockchain side. But coming back to the to the initial question and the original problem we set out to solve like seven years ago, is there an API for the blockchain? And I guess this is also a valid question right now and onboarding problem of the blockchain is not yet solved. But thanks to the graph protocol, we think that, yeah, now there is a block API for the blockchain and actually it serves a lot of uh, public blockchains and uh, yeah, it's also decentralized. And well, finally, Deutsche Telekom is able to provide an API for the blockchain through the graph protocol. So it also kind of completes the full circle for us in order to serve the blockchain data and uh, kind of uh, providing services on the blockchain stack, uh, not only uh, running some validator nodes or providing only blockchain consultancy. So basically what we are doing is that uh, with the graph, we are running... Uh, indexing uh, services, uh, along with all the other uh, tens of indexers on the graph protocol. Uh, we recently went live and uh, yeah, if you scan this QR code, you can find uh, more details about uh, our indexer on the graph dashboard. And uh, basically we're also open to public delegations. So if you guys are interested in delegating to our uh, service, I guess that's also highly appreciated. We are giving pretty nice uh, rewards. Uh, so in, in terms of delegation rewards, which is probably also more than what you normally get in the graph protocol. So yeah, that's a nice small summary of what we are doing uh, as a, a corporate in Web3 and also with the graph. Cool. I'm going to give you guys a, a small non-technical introduction to what the graph is and uh, how I'm involved in the ecosystem. And then also give you guys um, some information on how you guys could get involved. And then later on, we'll have Martin that will explain a little bit more uh, technical stuff and about uh, the company that he works for. So uh, my name is Colson. I'm a DAO member in Graph Advocates DAO, which is a community um, in the graph ecosystem that runs the ambassador program and the community grants program. Program, that will go into that a little bit later. Um, I also want to do a little bit um, of interaction with you guys just to check the level of what you guys already know. So if I ask you guys, who is already familiar with the graph? Who knows what we do and, and what it is? Okay, that's already a lot of people. Cool. That's good for me because then I don't have to go into detail on it. Um, so just to, for the people that have never heard from the graph, um, the graph is a decentralized protocol for indexing and querying blockchain data. Um, the graph makes it possible to query data that is usually very difficult to query directly. So we have a small example here. I stole this from uh, Brian Berman, who is uh, marketing at Edge Node. He explained it as if you look at blockchain data as an endless pit of M&Ms and you only want one specific sort of M&Ms or maybe only one of them, that's really very hard to do. You have to go through all of the M&Ms to find the one that you want and uh, that's very difficult. And if you look at that from a more technical way, you would have to need, you would need a lot of infrastructure, manpower, people that run the infrastructure and it's just a little bit of a mess. So what the graph comes in is this is 
a blockchain without the graph, and this is a blockchain with the graph. We uh, can sort the data in that way. Now you can think, what sort of data can you use? Like, uh, what can we use the graph for? Well, it's uh, a lot of different sorts. Uh, there's way more, but uh, these are some of that you can think of. So you can have DeFi data, data about DAOs, network analytics, wallets and payments, social data, and NFT data. And obviously the um, opportunities here and, and the possibilities are endless, but these are just some examples. Now, um, how do we sort the data? We use a piece of software called a subgraph, which is a decentralized open source API for accessing blockchain data. And uh, a lot of people have used dApps before, and here are some examples. So um, here you can probably see some of the decentralized applications that you have used before. Um, I have used many of them before. Um, yeah, so these are some of the top dApps that are powered by the graph that uh, use a lot of queries and uh, there are way more. So here's a couple more and uh, you will probably find some of them that you have used or that, that you have heard about. So um, a lot of people are already using the graph, which is really cool. And especially on events like this and when we go to the uh, hackathons and that kind of stuff, we run into a lot of people that are used uh, the graph for their data. And then it's always nice to get to know them and understand how they use it. So um, yeah, I want to share a little bit more about the uh, graph network now uh, that is completely decentralized. Now, how do we do that? We have a lot of people or teams or companies that uh, run infrastructure called the indexers that actually index all that blockchain data and then uh, can share it with you. Now, what are they indexing? They're indexing those subgraphs. So we need to know, because everybody can publish a subgraph, we need to know which subgraph has good data, which is high quality and which is needed. Where do curators come in? They look at the piece of software, they look at the subgraph and they see, oh, this, this subgraph, that one might be good. And then they can signal some GRT on it. Then we also have delegators, which were just introduced already. They can delegate their GRT to an indexer, so the indexer can put that GRT to good use. Um, and then also we have the subgraphs. So uh, those are the um, decentralized APIs. Now, we recently launched on Arbitrum as well, and we have some uh, cool stats right now. I actually was very surprised that the numbers on Arbitrum are already so high. So um, as you can see, we have 80 plus right in total. If you count both changed, we have over 200 indexers or teams of indexers that are uh, running the uh, infrastructure. Then we have a lot of delegators, over 15,000 at this point, a lot of curators, and also already a lot of subgraphs. And those subgraphs are on the decentralized version. If you go to the hosted service and the other uh, software or other solutions that we provide, that number goes into the tens of thousands. But this is only the decentralized network. So you can uh, check that out on the Graph Explorer and uh, find some cool subgraphs for yourself. Um, the cool part about this is as well that the curators and delegators don't have to be technical at all. So anybody that uh, has some GRT can start um, in, start uh, contributing to the ecosystem and help out in that way. Cool. So that whole decentralized network, how was that built and, and how uh, do we run that? So at the start, there was one company called uh, The Graph. Eventually, they changed their name to Edge and Node, and uh, they were the first source people that, um, well, ran the protocol. Right now, they are developing the decentralized protocols and advancing Web3. They were the initial team behind The Graph. Then we have the Graph Foundation. They are kind of uh, stewarding the whole ecosystem, so seeing who can contribute where and who can help each other out. Then we have GraphOps. We have the Guild, Mazari, uh, Pinax, which we'll hear about uh, a lot later. Uh, where we have Semiotic Labs and Streaming Fast. Now, all of these companies are separate, but they are working on the same project, which is the graph, or the same protocol, which is the graph. And all of these companies have their own uh, expertise, their own thing that they are really good at, and by working together, they can create this whole graph ecosystem. So I would like to speak now about uh, the stuff that I do, just because, uh, well, I'm an expert there, and I think that's uh, cool to share. So um, the Graph Advocates DAO was launched about 20 months ago with the objective of running the Graph Advocates program and the Graph Community Grants program for grants that are under 20,000 um, per quarter. And from those community grants, that's why we're here now, um, you, Deutsche Telekom went through that process, applied for a community grant, and uh, we're here now. Um, yeah, so the Advocates program, which is something that I'm really excited about. Uh, I'm in the team that runs that program, kind of stewards all of the advocates worldwide. And I want to share with you kind of our expertise there, uh, what we have now and how you guys can contribute. Because we have a, a very cool person here called Andy that has been running the Graph Germany for quite some time. Yeah, and we would like to have some more help there. So 
Um, after this, if you guys are excited and if you guys see any of the roles that you think you can help out in, uh, please uh, come to Martin, myself, or uh, Andy, and we can see how you guys can get involved. Um, the cool part about the Advocates program is that it starts off from almost zero contribution. So if you only have one hour a month to contribute, but you think you can do provide really valuable contributions, then we would love to have you on that program. So uh, yeah, we are trying to recruit some people today for the Graph Germany. Okay, so the Graph Advocates uh, was launched about a little bit later than the Advocates now, I think about a year or 18 months ago, probably, and uh, started out with all of the DAO members, which started out 30 people. Um, relatively global, but not that much yet. Um, we've grown quite a lot. We have over 300 graph advocates now from 50 different countries um, all over the world. So wherever we have an event now, wherever there's a big event going, you will usually find a couple of graph advocates that will be there and uh, you can meet them and help them out. Um, yeah, so what are the roles that you can do in the Graph Advocates program? One of them is event evangelism. So you can host events, you can attend events like this and speak about the Graph or about any other uh, thing you're excited about in Web3. So it's not only about the Graph, it's also about growing the Web3 ecosystem. So if you are an expert in something else that is not the Graph, but you would really like to speak about it, then you can become a Graph Advocate and also go to events to speak about them. And also online events, that kind of stuff. So if you have a Twitter space that you see, or if you get invited to a panel um, to speak about your experience in Web3, you can also do that. And we have seen quite a bit. So we have, we have here uh, the Graph Pakistan that hosts an event at a university, uh, very well attended, about 50 people in attendance, and they kept doing that. So Graph Pakistan is growing a lot. We also have a lot of online spaces, uh, usually on Twitter or Telegram, that people can join and attend. Then the next one, and this one I find really cool because I'm really bad at this, so I'm always super impressed when people are really good at content creation. Uh, we, you can create content about the graph or Web3 or about anything else that you're excited about, including articles, videos, infographics, um, well, basically all the content that you would like to make. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of really cool people that are really good at creating content in the Graph Advocates program, so it's always really nice to see. A couple of examples. Um, because it's a community-driven project, we have a lot of uh, updates from the ecosystem. So we have a graph advocate called Kyle that writes every week a um, advocate spotlight, talking about all of the things that are happening in and around the ecosystem. As you can imagine, with so many different companies and so many different people working together, so many dApps, a community spotlight is always very helpful. So um, that's really cool. And because we have a graph advocate in so many different countries, they all, it also gets translated to about 10 different languages. I think also to German, Andy. Yeah, a little bit. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, German as well, but a lot of other uh, languages as well. And we also have, uh, well, sub subgraph signal. So if there's a new subgraph that is highly valuable, we write some tweets about it. And we also have some memes, of course. We have text translators, and this is a role that is really interesting because a lot of people that join the Advocates program that speak a language that might be underrepresented start out in this role. And by starting out in this role, by translating documentation and a lot of other uh, articles and that kind of stuff, they uh, learn really fast about the graph. And usually after they do a good job at text translating, they can then also roll into other positions really easily because they have practiced so much and learned so much about uh, the graph and the ecosystem. And it also brings a very valuable contribution because of course nobody or not everyone speaks English very well so if you translate to a native country or a native language then that might be very helpful to uh, boost web3 in your area and uh, here we have an example of that uh, graph advocate spotlight that gets translated into different languages um, we have uh, French here and I, I'm not sure about the other one I think it's Urdu but I'm not sure so this one I started out in a long time ago in community care. Uh, basically, I started out in the graph by looking at the chat rooms and answering questions, providing documentation. And this is a role that you can get started in really easily because the only thing you have to do is be active in a community that you like and answering questions. And if you don't know the answer to a question, you can refer it to somebody else that does. And that way, all of the questions get answered really easily. So uh, this is also a way where you can engage with the community and also learn a lot by yourself. Because if you don't know the answer to something, but then somebody else finds the answer and you can learn and eventually uh, you can start teaching. And that's uh, basically where I got my start in the ecosystem a long time ago. And then eventually it led to a full-time position. So this is a really cool, um, small way that you can contribute, but it's super helpful. Well, yeah, some examples here of people answering questions, but that's not really exciting. 
Um, so technical teacher is uh, kind of the same as the community care role or the event evangelist role, but more technical. So uh, some stuff that Martin is done talk about that would fall really well under technical teaching uh, because it's more about the tech behind the graph and that kind of stuff. This stuff I cannot do, so I, I leave that over to you. <laughs> Yeah, and we have some uh, graph advocates and uh, DAO members that create educational series on uh, how to use the graph and how to start coding. And uh, Pinex is also doing a really good job at that. So if you want to check out more stuff about that, you should check out the uh, Pinex YouTube channel. Maybe you can shout it out after your talk. Yeah, so uh, th this was it for now. Um, you don't have to scan this code if you don't want to, but it basically leads to our website and about my socials. So you can get into contact with me easily, but I'm here already. So if you want to get more involved, uh, just come up to me after the next talks and uh, we can chat about it and hopefully onboard some of you as new graph advocates. Thank you so much. Thanks, Colson, for the introduction. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I'm Martin. Um, Quick introduction for me, um, as a technical teacher, I'm a non-tech person, so uh, I come into Web3 through like any detour, like what I like about Web3, why I'm passionate about it is because everybody has their own story. I meet so many interesting people coming from all kinds of backgrounds and all unified by this idea of a decentralized, better internet. So I'm now the VP of marketing for Pinex and um, a graph advocate, so Really, uh, I can just tell you guys, sign up and you get to know a couple of people being passionate about the graph and Web3. Um, a little bit about my story. So how I got into, into Web3 and the graph. I actually, like, my background is painting. I'm a painter. And I went to China, like 2008, and I wanted to learn traditional painting there. I did a lot of culture exchange programs, got to know a lot of uh, a Chinese artist and they were telling me like hey how do you sell artists I have this client outside of China uh, and he wants to offer me a lot of money and they I said like okay how you want to do it and then some people talked about Bitcoin and I, I learned that in China people are actually really smart circumventing any kind of censorship financial censorship or whatever they do and the big promise is really Web3 so you would be amazed how knowledgeable people in China are about Web3 and that was really my intro, being uh, in China for 15 years uh, in total. I came back last year, but I started 2015 hosting a bunch of blockchain meetups, got to know a lot of people, and that's how I basically ended up being the VP of marketing right now for Pinex, and apparently a technical speaker, uh, teacher. Anyway, that's about me. So what you got from me, inviting me here, what you got yourself into, I give you a little bit of overview right now. First, we will learn about the Pinex, the Pinex, the company, what I'm working for, a little intro, what we do with the graph. Uh, then we will learn about Fios and substreams. So we learn about subgraphs. I hear you guys know about the graph and subgraphs. So substreams and Fios is more or less like the evolution of subgraphs. Um, and we'll learn about it, why it's needed. We are seeing how it's changing the game for developers and, and everybody that's using kind of the graph. Uh, then we have insights in future use cases, current use cases as well. And then, yeah, how to get started. If there are developers in the room, I will give you some tips on how to get started, get more information. So, quick intro to Pinex. We are a Web3 service provider. So, we are specialized in blockchain data indexing. We have since three years worked with Firehose related uh, technology. Firehose is a technology that you will learn about in a bit. And um, yeah, well, we believe in bare metal. We want to run our own infrastructure. We don't run anything on cloud. So we run our own infrastructure in various data centers across the world. And um, yeah, we're self-funded. So it started all in 2018 when seven people come together, funded the company. And since then, it's been a great adventure. Like, I think we made two bear markets and we're still alive. We're currently... Uh, a growing team. We have 50 plus people all across the world. Uh, I started out in China, now I'm here. We have people uh, also in India, we have people in Africa, in Nigeria, we have people in Canada, at quarter in Canada, we have most of the people. Um, yeah, what else? Yeah, we're operating the Firehose. Let's see what the Firehose is all about. Um, yeah, here are some people uh, from our company operating the Firehose. That's why we're all wearing the Firehose helmet as, at conferences. I actually had the pleasure to meet uh, the telecom people like Muji at the DEPCON here in Berlin. And that's where we kind of started to think about the idea of hosting the first meetup here. So thanks to all that, we are here today. 
Uh, we see Daniel Keys, our CEO there. Yaro being uh, at um, the Rust conference uh, in Toronto, I think. And uh, yeah, if you see us around wearing a FIO helmet, take a selfie, you might win some Ethereum. Um, so our key roles as a like core developer team in the graph is basically running the FIOS infrastructure in order to scale the graph. We'll, we'll learn now how this really works. The other thing that we're doing is like uh, running RPC nodes. Uh, we are essential in um, enabling multi-chain support for the graph. If you guys are aware of the GIP57, uh, the graph is currently going through onboarding more and more chains because we're heading into a multi-chain future where it's not just one blockchain. All the blockchains will be co coexisting and interacting in some sense. So the graph is really essential in that, in that regard. Uh, running the infrastructure, we're also giving a lot of feedback around performance and uh, downtime uh, to the developers of software. Uh, and uh, yeah, part of it is also doing community uh, educational materials and all of that. Um, I want to introduce you to another core dev that um, Colson quickly touched upon. But um, without streaming fast, we wouldn't have FIOS and substreams. They developed the, the software to do it. And we've, we have a pretty close uh, relationship, working relationship with them over years. And uh, we as an infrastructure provided, they as a software development uh, team running really well together. We give them a lot of feedback and we test their, their software. So if you want to learn about more about Fios and Substreams, their documentation is great. Check them out. Um, and really kudos to this team. Really interesting stuff that they built. So let's get into it. You still there? Okay. So we, we saw this, the Skittles or M&M &M example that uh, Colson showed us. I think we can think about um, blockchain uh, being more vast. If you think about Ethereum, there's so many transactions, there's so much data, like finding a single transaction is really like trying to find an ocean, uh, trying to find a drop in an ocean. It's really complicated. It's really hard to differentiate different transactions, different smart contracts, applications, and trying to find uh, drops that are connected to each other, let's say one user profile or one smart contract. It's even harder. Like This is where the graph comes in, trying to build indexes around the subset of data, let's say a smart contract, an application, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that works quite well until now, and it provides something that we're all excited about. The transparency, basically, what really gives me a lot of um, motivation and inspiration for working in Web3 is the transparency. However, most of the valuable data that, that we have in, in blockchains, that's not really accessible. It's opaque. And it's getting more and more and more if we're thinking about a multi-chain future. So that's oceans of oceans of oceans piling into each other. We have users being active on multiple chains and they want to have their data accessible in one language, in one subset. So what we need right here is a, is a connector that, that is scalable, that can read all these blockchains and generate indexes that, is real, that are really making the data from various blockchains accessible. Now, that's exactly where the FIOS comes in. So all these little bubbles, all these oceans that are their own bubbles, we create a new bubble, a giant bubble, a giant ocean that accumulates all the water, all the drops in one bubble. That's basically the FIOS standard. What FIOS does, it extracts data. It takes the data off the blocks, out of the blockchain. It doesn't matter what, what necessarily the, the APIs are, when the blockchain forked, when there was a code update, whatever it is, the Firehose extracts all the data and saves it in one format. So what you can think about it is like a universal standard for extracting blockchain data and therefore equalizing the language or translating the language of all the blockchains and then stores them into the Firehose API. It's a scalable and stable infra infrastructure uh, interface for all the blockchains. Um, that then powers something called substreams. So the substreams are, let's go here. Oh no, I will show this later. Um, so what the substreams do, they act specific data sets from the Firehose and are um, 
Yeah, they're more or less like this straw. So what we want to achieve for developers is like they don't necessarily need to run the infrastructure to to access all this data. The the developer wants to be like easygoing, develop its app, create a token, whatever it is, create a subgraph or a substream, and then chill out and just have its own specific straw to suck the data that it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it. So that's basically what the Firehose does. How it does it, it's flat files. Who here knows what flat files are? All right, one person, I give you a little. <laughs> so flat files are basically like compressed data. So you know all zip zip files on your computer. Um, how the, the flat files in the Firehose works, they basically take up to 100 blocks and create like one file for it. So when you're indexing for it, you don't need to look for a specific block header. You look for the zip file and you know that this, the, for the flat file in that sense, and you know that this data is in there. So with with that, the Firehose makes blockchain data indexing uh, really efficient. Um, the costs uh, for blockchain indexing with Firehose are 90% less compared to any other RPC nodes in the graph. So that's really the efficiency for indexers, how we can really leverage this and be more profitable uh, running uh, the graph infrastructure, running any kind of indexing software. Um, so Firehose is available already, like due to this like giant leap in performance, like it's being adopted by all the main chains, very popular chains. More are coming uh, as we go. And um, yeah, if you're building on any of these chains already or want to build something on them, uh, get in touch. We get you some API keys and you can start building. So I gave you a lot of knowledge right now about what extracting data from a blockchain is and how, how the Fios does it. Uh, how it's like communicated by streaming files, it's like what we have here with this stack, Fios and substreams, it's a shared intelligence layer. We're making the, the knowledge that is stored through various applications uh, on blockchains available for everyone. And then with substreams, you have a massively scalable, paralyzable, um, transformation engine specific for, for Firehose data. So some of the benefits for substreams compared to uh, subgraphs is that they're composable. So composing different substreams together uh, is like you can basically leverage the work from other developers that, that had built the substreams and you can merge them together. In this example, we see, for example, like each, each of these colors is a different author. It's a different, different developer that created the substreams. Uh, what we do here is we take like the, the composed one that it's the average of prices, like the prices of various tokens. Then we combine this substream with the OpenSea NFT sales. And what we have then as a result, as an output, so all of the above are inputs from different substreams, and we can compose them without coding them. We can just compose them together to a new output, which basically gives you the trading volume in USD immediately um, of like a specific NFT collection on OpenSea. So that's one advantage that we have with substreams compared to subgraphs. So subgraphs are more or less like silos of data. We can't combine them with substreams. We can merge them together. And it's more into in the open source ethos that I think the whole industry is building on. Uh, another advantage is you can decide how you want to store your database. So that's a transformable aspect of, of, fire, uh, of um, substreams. Whereas um, Subgraphs have their own the graph node basically on where you can store it. With substreams, you can go into any output that you define. What is the database that's most suitable for your application, for your use case? Do you want to have multiple outputs? You can predefine any database as a sync for your substream. Um, another aspect is the speed. I think the speed is a, the most, the biggest selling point when we're thinking about indexing and developer cycles. So currently, substreams are performing eight times faster uh, than than the usual subgraph. Um, it's two months to one week. If you're a developer and you you want to see how if your subgraph is working, if your system is working, you don't want to wait two months in order to sync your notes. One week gives you a lit a huge advantage. And uh, Vincent uh, from Asari, another core developer uh, on the graph, just 
that's a nice tweet. It's one year old. It might, might be faster right now, but he synced like the whole history of Ethereum in just 20 minutes, you, leveraging the power of substreams. So this is huge. The way um, substreams are doing this is the parallelizable aspect of it. So we can break down the blocks, break, break down the processing into multiple processors, and then the re results at the end gets, get merged. Um, that's basically like the, the secret behind it. You can throw more and more, more hardware on it, more and more server power, and then you get just faster results, syncing up your nodes and getting the data out of your substream. So to summarize the, the main benefits of substreams um, and what it is, it's a specific in information that you can get from basically all of uh, the, the blockchain, um, any blockchain. The Firehose gives you the whole enchilada, like full history. What the substream is, it gives you a specific subset of this data and it speeds up the process of like syncing it and um, loading it by being composable. So you don't really need to put much time into the development. You can benefit from other people's work. Um, you can parameter... <laughs> so that's the word that I was trying yesterday for the whole time. Parameterizable. It's parameterizable. That means... Even if there's a, a substream, you can, with certain parameters, even get a more specific subset of the substream itself. And you can automize certain maps, um, certain indicators within the substream, and it can automate this process. It's transformable. You can output the, the, the output of, of, the, of the substreams in any format, as I, as I just uh, defined with all the word cloud there. And then it's parallelizable. So blocks get get. Uh, processed in parallel in your server side, and then it just speeds up the whole syncing process. Um, Substreams are available since the spring. There have been a lot of people starting to work with it. In uh, later times, I can show you some examples that are currently working and some outlook. Having shorter development cycles, you can go faster to market and we can get more applications into the system faster. We can iterate faster. If users have some kind of feedback, if you're working in a DAO, whatever you want, like you get faster results and the whole market develops uh, basically at larger speeds. Um, in As a pipeline, thinking about how fires and substreams work in conjunction together, we have the ETLQ pipeline. It stands for Extract, Transform, Load, and Query. Uh, so we learned that the Firehose streams data. That's, that's another thing. Like every first block gets immediately streamed into the network. And then later at like number 100, blocks are being uh, produced. Then it creates a new flat file, puts it in the history node, basically. Then it transforms. The substream starts transforming um, all of the data from the specific firehose into like a subset. And then you can load it in multiple things. The output is really easy for you to define. And then it goes to the user querying. Um, so summary of all of the things that I just uh, told you. What we do here is essentially like decoupling the writing from the reading. Most of the blockchain protocols, all the new blockchains, they focus on writing data. Users start transacting, their transactions go, are written in blocks. The reading is, own, is often just like solved in different ways. What we have here is we decouple this and have a unified standard. Um, Data completeness, like the flat files include all the data that there is in a block. There is no kind of purge or there's no, nothing that that uh, you might miss afterwards. It's the complete enchilada of all the uh, blockchain data that you need. It's running in parallel, so it's scalable um, as much as you can scale your own infrastructure or your provider can scale it for you. That's where we come into play. And then it's powering actually subgraphs, the next generation of, of subgraphs, um, which you might find, might People call it right now substreams powered subgraphs. That's what you might want to look for. And it's all open source. So, you know, it's really a, a, a technology that you can start playing with, that you can enhance, like, and uh, it's out in the open. Uh, so let's jump into some applications that we currently, uh, that are already live. Uh, our accountant, actually, like in our company, we have, uh, we deal with normal transactions, we do, you know, finan traditional financial transactions, and we have blockchain transactions. Feeding these blockchain transactions or accounting for this is quite hard. So you have different uh, market pr prices for different tokens, and you have, let's say, like when you pay them out, they have a different value. So feeding 
basically like uh, a combined value of like what the price was at a time and when you did the transaction and then feed this data directly into Google Sheets made that really easy for them. So I said like substreams are transformable, like the way we feed this into a Google Sheet directly really empowered our accountant to like work way faster. Uh, we also use it for chatbots. Uh, so when there's, let's say, you do an NFT project and there's a new uh, sale going on, there's a new, um, uh, op like a new offer for an NFT. This can be immediately run into Discord, Telegram, any kind of uh, chatbot that you want, and uh, any kind of web web three analytics like Spyglass can also be done um, already live. There's no code needed. You can combine different substreams there and visualize the analytics in any way you want it. So check out Spyglass if you want to play with with no code, with no coding skills, and see the power of substreams. Um, shout out to Luxo, a big fan of Luxo, also a Berlin-based uh, company, uh, and they're working really to make um, um, blockchain usable, and they're working a lot on on these future use cases. So we will have more and more users coming in with the next wave, having like applications like. GameFi economics, you can trade your game assets. Uh, digital identity is something that will come up. Uh, and I, I heard Muji talking about, they're talking to the German government about it, which is exciting. Uh, DAO reputation systems, um, Web3 social media, AW assets. So all these kind of things, they will have a new influx of users. Um, more and more data will be generated. So we really need to have like a scalable backbone that provides all the information, all the blockchain data for the users, specifically for an application or for a user profile. So I think it's really important that we have something that's scalable and substreams will power the future of Web3. Um, right now for the developers to get started, um, all you need to know, you can start with substreams that are already existing because they're composable. Just to get started, you need to learn a little bit of Rust if you want to build your own one. But after that, once you have created your data feed, all you need to do, you can use any language that you want, JavaScript, TypeScript, Golang, Python, whatever you want. Um, and then get an API key. If you want to just dabble with it, go to pinx.network. Uh, hit the start building button, and then you can choose from all the blockchains that we currently offer. Uh, and we constantly add more. And uh, yeah, for more information on all, all of that, visit our Substreams Unleashed video series where we ha do demos. If you're playing with Substreams already, give us a shout out. We can do an interview demo with you, showcase the open source software that you have built. You can go to our blog where most of the information is like really like um, more digestible. Um, and uh, the awesome Substreams repo on GitHub, you can Everybody can contribute there from the ecosystem. It's basically a repo for everything substreams that's being built. And follow us on Twitter, uh, at Pinox Network, because most of the information, most of the updates, new supported chains, we will populate there. And that's it. Thank you. Um, great. <laughs> uh, shout out, uh, no. If you want more questions, and uh, you know, reach out to me at martin at pinox.network. And now we have Paul. So nice to meet you all. I am Paul. I am from Kive. Uh, so I am head of ecosystem at Kive. To give you a bit of my background, uh, I started in crypto uh, on a Polkadot-based chain that is called Ternoa. So we were doing uh, augmented NFT. So basically encrypted data in NFT and then uh, only with smart contract, people can access it in the future. Uh, so kind of NFT legacy. And on the side, I'm also a Binance Angel. So Binance Angel are the people managing uh, offline and online community uh, for Binance in uh, local uh, regions. So I am from France. Sorry for my French accent tonight. Um, I'm not German. <laughs> so why Kive? Um, so Kive, first of all, is not a competitor to the graph. I think it's important uh, to specify that because a lot of people are asking us. Actually, Edge and Node, that is, um, as Colson expl explained, uh, is behind the graph is one of our investors. We have also major layer one blockchain uh, such Solana, Cosmos, Polkadot, Mina, Aurora, Celo, and so on. So how Kive start? Kive start between a bounty uh, on a bounty between Parity Foundation and Arweave. And the bounty was how we can upload historical data of of Polkadot on Arweave. The thing is, 
it's a major issue that we have on all proof of stake mechanism network right now that historical data of blockchain are very centralized. Uh, I'm not going to give any name tonight, uh, but for example, you have some blockchain that have only one archival node that are hosted on a Amazon Web Service. So you can imagine that it's a big issue in the future if Amazon decide just to shut down their node. Um, the thing is, if you upload yourself the data on our web, I have to relay on you and to trust you that you have uploaded the correct historical data of a blockchain. And it's where Kive come in. So to give you a quick explanation, we have here a data stream. So it can be any blockchain data or any, in fact, off-chain data that will be created through a pool where you will have uploaders and validators. So it's basically you or me that will run a protocol node on Kive for a data stream on a data pool. And we will, all of us, run an archival node of those data that we need. So for example, if I want to archive Cosmos Hub, we all, all of us gonna run a Gaia node, I will be the uploader and you're gonna be the validator. I'm gonna upload those data into a decentralized storage solution, such as Arweave, and you're gonna check basically if the data that I have uploaded are matching your source of data. Because it's deterministic data, no matter how many data sources we have, all the data should always match. And then after, since those data are marked as valid, if the majority of you guys have voted that the data are valid, they are stored, for example, on Arweave, you can retrieve those data and you are sure that the data you are using, for example, to build your indexer are correct. Um, the graph I've released, like, if I am not wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but last, two weeks ago, I think, that no, you can build a subgraph on top of uh, Arweave and query the data directly from Arweave. Yeah, so from an if Milan, something like that? Probably, okay. <laughs> so you, you, you can just basically, instead of running your infrastructure, of running your archival node on your own, you're just incentive to produce block, but not to keep historical data. It's for that that it's lead to a centralization. You can rely on a decentralized source of data and not paying to access those data because they're accessible for free since stored on with. I see the pizza coming, so I will try to hurry up. Once those data are stored on Arweave, what can you do with it? So Arweave, you can access those data thanks to the graph through the subgraph no, since two weeks ago. But you can also, we have built on top of that solution. So the ELT pipeline you present just before the ETL pipeline, so it's a bit different with the ELT pipeline. Instead of transforming the data and then loading them, we are first of first loading them and then transforming them. Meaning you don't have to re-download again the whole data set to transform those data. So it's work with many destinations. We are supporting more than 60 destinations. Uh, so it's go to MyGraph, SQQL, Postgres, Snowflake, SQL, and so on. But you can also build your own ELT pipeline or, or your own ETL pipeline. Kind of have not aim to become an indexer. What we are doing, it's a decentralized validation layer between data sources and decentralized storage solution. Other use cases that you have, right now, if you want to state, state sync your node, you have either to download the entire state of the blockchain, so that's going to take time and going to be costly, or you can just ask for a snapshot to join the network, but it's very centralized. So we have built a solution that is called casing that allows you to access to state at any height of a blockchain in less than two minutes for the blockchain that have been archived through Kive. Um, that's a decentralized way of having snapshots, meaning if you want block 10,000, for example, you can just casing your node directly and you are sure the data you are re retrieving are correct. So for now, we have integrated Cosmos Hub that we have archived at 99%. We're never gonna be at 100% unless the chain stop working. <laughs> so I don't wish that. Uh, we have Osmosis, Arcway, Axela. We're gonna have more like uh, chain uploaded, like archived in the next uh, few months that are not Thundermint runtime. We are working by runtime. So right now we are really focusing on Thundermint, meaning all the Cosmos chain. 
uh, but we're going to extend for sure to EVM. Solana have a big need on that to give you just few data. Uh, Solana is three petabytes of data per year at full capacity. So I don't think any of us here have the money to run an archival node for Solana. It's way too expensive. And so it's lead to centralization. In terms of daily transaction, we launched mainnet uh, around six months ago. We are at 120,000 transactions daily. A transaction for us is not sending money or token to someone. A transaction means people that are v voting on bundles. So every three minutes, we have a bundle, meaning a piece of data, going on Kive protocol. One uploader, 49 validators, and they are voting. So in total, with those four pools, we have 120,000 transactions per day. We plan to have for sure more pools, some more transactions. And we have archived in a completely decentralized way 1.38 terabyte of data. What is important to notice also and to say, it's all those data are permanently stored for at least 200 years. So they can't be corrupted. They can't be deleted. They are at least on 20 like nodes through the Arweave ecosystem. So you can always retrieve those data and be sure that those data will be accessible for everyone and for the long term. After you can use it to do analytics, to do like create your wallet, create an explorer, whatever you want, accounting, if you are doing your accounting, but I think German people are doing more their accounting than French. So, <laughs> so the roadmap, right now we plan to have uh, more integration um, on the Cosmos ecosystem. So we plan to have for sure DYDX, um, Arcway, so why Arcway, since we have already archived them and Axelar? Uh, it's, because for, it's because for casing, we need to have a second pool. So we will launch those two pools for them to be able to casing their node. Um, I think Celestia also um, going to be archived. Uh, data availability is not data validity and data permanently stored, meaning Celestia have also archival node and will also can also face this issue. Uh, of centralization of their historical data. For 2024, we plan to go on like Solana, probably Polkadot Chain, Mina, also Avalanche, um, probably Ethereum, because there is a big need. Um, if you are following the news with Nethermind, I think they have shut down their archival node for uh, Ethereum. Um, and all layer two, um, if you want to dip a bit more in the layer two subject, uh, Validium that have been introduced that Polygon, for example, will use um, all those historical data to reduce the cost and to increase the scalability will be stored off chain. Um, and if you check the like Ethereum uh, blog, you can see that they have a crypto incentive to, f to publish those data, to make those data accessible, but you are not sure that they have to do it. So if they want to do it, they can do it. They have the right to don't send you those data. So you have kind of to trust them that they will always make those data accessible for you. I don't see any reason not, but we never know what uh, the future can be. Um, if you want to join Kive um, and build with our data, all of, the, all of our data are accessible for free. So as I say, you don't need to reach out to us. You can build also your own integration. We are fully permissionless, meaning you can start, create, I don't know if you want to archive data that have been um, that, that have been used like through Chainlink, for example, Oracle data to keep historic history of those data in the future for accounting or whatever. Uh, you can do it. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the great presentations. Um, and I happily announced the pizza which just arrived. So feel free to uh, grab, grab a bite. And yeah, thank you everyone.